Well, while, while the slides appear, I would say that uh, I would really love to be able to deliver the speech in, in Ukrainian, to be able to speak Ukrainian, not only to deliver the speech, but also to understand the other presentations that seem to be really, really amazing. So I'm, I'm limited to uh, seeing the slides, but um, Okay, yeah, so um, I am a, I'm an academic, so I come from a... a, a Far away, I come from Mexico, and my area of, spe of specialty is uh, me uh, I'm a methodologist, right? I, I uh, my area of expertise is software uh, architecture development methods. But I'm an academic, but I don't like to stay uh, in academia. I like to work with companies, and uh, uh, so I've been, I've been working with many companies in, in, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and. Uh, with SoftServe, we've been collaborating with uh, for uh, about uh, four years, I think, and I'm really happy to say that this year we have a much closer collaboration, so we're going to be working uh, together more closely during the year. So, um, the lights now? Okay. You have a browser? Okay, so let's just move. We just need a browser. So today I'm going to be speaking uh, about some research that uh, we conducted, and me and some colleagues that I'm going to talk about in the next slide, around uh, three years ago. So it's, it, even if some of, of, of that research uh, we did it a few years ago, I think the message is still uh, really uh, valid and in line with the presentations that we, we saw before. So this, uh, this work that I'm going to be talking about, we did it with uh, Rick Caseman, who is also somebody who has come here, who has, uh, we have uh, taught here. Uh, he works at the SEI and the University of Hawaii. And John Ryu, who is a, a researcher in the area of security. So he's the, he's the specialist in security. Um, and well, we saw, we saw this uh, really great uh, presentation about security, which is the one I would really have liked to understand better what was being said, and but we saw that it's uh, it's a really complex problem, right? <laughs> you, you know that very well. And uh, it's up to, to a few years ago, this hasn't really been a focus on software development. So so people in general are more focused on the, uh, developing like the functionalities and and security has come more like a a layer concern. It, 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 it has arrived. Uh, it is something that is left out for, for a, <coughs> as it says here, as a band aid solution. And mm, again, some of the, the uh, focus that had been uh, made on security was more on secure coding practices like protecting for, from buffer overflows or entries, uh, uh, like uh, text entries and all that. But it's much more complex than that. So uh, security is the weakest link phenomena, uh, phenomenon. So if, even if the most of the code is secure, if there's only a fraction that contains vulnerabilities, then uh, the system will be vulnerable. So these security practices are also expensive. They require a lot of work. So in line with what was said in the previous presentation, the message that uh, I want to, to, to give here is that we, we should take security into account from an architectural uh, perspective, right? So um, this is not only focusing on, on, the sec on the code aspect of things, but thinking more in a bigger way. Of 
course, architecture, software architecture is not uh, the, uh, like the solution to uh, insufficient to, to ensure that the software would be, sec would be secure. We saw many other practices, but in this research that we did, we wanted to, to see uh, in more detail or to analyze if there was a difference in thinking uh, about security from an architectural perspective. So if we, if we see uh, architectural uh, design like in, uh, in, a, in a one picture, it's, it's here, right? So on the, on the left side, we have the architectural drivers that are the requirements that are the input for the architect who makes design decisions and then produces the, the design. But here what interests us is what we call the design concepts. So what are the, the design concepts? Uh, are the building blocks to build an architecture. So usually you don't wanna, you don't wanna start from scratch, you wanna find solutions, proven solutions, to the problems that occur once over and over during the design of a software system. So there's different types of design concepts so some of them are uh, reference architectures. I'm going to cover them, each one of them. Uh, but there are reference architectures. There are deployment patterns. There are architectural patterns. There are tactics, and there are externally developed components. So the the goal, the the end of goal is not to reinvent the wheel, right? But rather to reuse proven solutions. So reference architectures. Uh, I guess everybody is familiar with them. They're blueprints to, for, for certain types of systems. So here we have a, an example for a traditional web, web application. And we see that in references architecture, we find security there. This is here a cross-cutting concern that uh, goes across all the layers of the system. There are deployment patterns for security. So this one in particular is about trusted subsystems, right? So uh, we have here a web server that is uh, accessing a, a, a database server and there is a uh, trusted service identity. And like this, there are many or other uh, deployment patterns for security. Security patterns, I, which I think are different from the ones that we saw in the, in the other presentation, but for, for, for instance, in this book, there is a catalog of patterns for security. And there is a, a well-established number of patterns uh, for security, but as the traditional design patterns, you have to uh, code these, these patterns, and they can be difficult to correctly implement, maintain, and combine. So here is an example from this catalog. This is a, a firewall pattern, and it's shown here in a, from a logic point of view, and here is a runtime uh, point of view of, of, of this pattern. The other uh, rele relevant design concept for security is security tactics. So this is one thing that uh, you may be aware of. So architectural tactics are like strategies that you can use to respond to a particular quality attribute. So for example, if you're interested in uh, security, there's a set of tactics. It's uh, again, as I say, it's like a catalog of strategies that you can use. To, uh, to, to, to enforce security. So if you want to detect attacks, you can, for example, detect intrusions, verify the integrity of messages. If you want to resist attacks, you can, for example, identify actors, authenticate actors, etc. If you want to re react to attacks, you can revoke access, lock the computer, and if you want to recover from attacks, you may want to maintain an audit trail. So this catalog is very useful, and we're going to see how it can be used uh, as a checklist later on. But security tactics were, uh, were uh, introduced by the SCI in their book, Software Architecture Principles and Practices. And this is more like a, a general collection of strategies. So when you see the tactic catalog for security, you see this list of tactics, but they don't tell you how to implement those tactics. Tactics, right? It's up to you to decide how you're gonna do this. And another uh, tool in the collection of design concepts is the externally developed components, which can range from libraries or frameworks to uh, to complete complete off-the-shelf solutions, right? So, in the case of this particular study, we were interested in frameworks, in the use of frameworks as an approach 
to, to dealing with security. So a framework, you're all familiar with them, they're the reusable software elements that provide generic functionality, addressing recurring concerns across a broad range of applications. So there's many security frameworks for many languages and technology stacks. So here's a, a small sample, mostly from for Java, Java-based security. And they increase productivity because you don't have to write things uh, completely from scratch, but you need to learn the framework and often you stay locked, uh, locked in uh, to a particular framework. So what we did in this study is we wanted to understand if there was a big difference in using these security frameworks or not. So, uh, so we can address security in a more, let's say, primitive way if you want to code everything from scratch, which probably no, no, not much people will want to do today, but you can use uh, the patterns and tactics and try to to create your security solution from there. But in this case, we wanted to investigate what was the difference in using security frameworks. So we did some experiments to try to study the difference. So we created these, these experiments, and we wanted to understand how the practicing architects, some practicing architects approach security, and how their, their approaches help secure the system. And we wanted to explore the trade-off between using certain approach with respect to the effort that it took uh, about using uh, that, that particular approach. So we performed four case studies, and I know this is a small number, but we, we, we studied real systems, and it's so not always easy to go to companies and let them uh, us, uh, see their systems and, and analyze them. So this is why it's a, it's a small sample, but these four samples that represented for uh, three different security approaches with respect to how the architects approach uh, the, the, the support for security. So we call them uh, full adoption or early adoption. And here the idea is that the architects, right from the beginning, chose the technologies uh, that he would use, uh, at the, again, at the framework level, to uh, support security. Partial or later adoption. This is a case of where systems were originally uh, built without considering the use of a particular security framework in mind. But later on during the project, the, the system, uh, the, the, a security framework was incorporated into the system. And no adoption. This is where a system is built without using particular security libraries. So how we did this, we, did, we took two approaches. The first one was to interview the architects. So we, we spoke with the architects, and later on I'm going to show how we uh, uh, interviewed them to understand how they were approaching security. And the second thing that we did is we used a, a, a scanner, a vulnerability scanner, to uh, see how vulnerable or how, yes, how secure maybe the, the, their system was. Right? So we used a, a vulnerability scanner, scanner called AppScan from IBM. So let me show, uh, tell you about the four case studies. So the first case study is an, an open source application called OpenEMR, which is one of the most popular uh, open source electronic medical records today. Uh, it was built using PHP but they built it without any particular security framework in mind. So they only use some common library functions to address a limited set of vulnerabilities, such as SQL injections and, uh, and things, uh, limited things like that. And we did an interview with the architect for this system. The second uh, case study, where, uh, we worked with a company called Code One in Korea. So this company is a security company who creates a, a security framework called Code One Framework. And one of the, the things that they do is they take uh, usually uh, systems which are uh, already been running and which have been designed without a security approach in mind or a more ad hoc like we saw before a security approach in mind, and they introduce their framework into the system, right? So uh, the system that we analyzed here is called Agme because it's one. It was one public uh, about the government 
a system about the, from the Korean government, so we don't, we don't have the name, but uh, it's a web application that was built out of JSPs and HTML, and as I was saying, initially it was developed without paying attention to security, then code one was called so that they could incorporate their framework into the application. So we have two case studies here, one which called which we called before, so that's before the, 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 uh, the framework was in, uh, introduced, and after the framework was introduced. And in this case, we didn't speak with the architect of this application, but we spoke with the architect from Code One, who was responsible for, for uh, conducting this project. A third, pro a third, third case study is uh, from a Mexican company, which who uh, had been collaborating uh, with a few years ago. It's called Quarksoft. So it's a company that develops custom software for uh, customers in, in different domains. And they built an internal tool for themselves so that they could gather data about projects and also uh, track the, pro the pro progress of the project. So their tool was developed in Java and used the Spring Security Framework and another web framework called ZK. I don't know if you're familiar with this framework or not, but uh, normally ZK, they advertise themselves as they, like they uh, care especially about security. And in this case, we interviewed the architect of the tool. And finally, another anonymous case study. It's a financial, a financial institution, and they created a web portal for this, their customers so that they could see some of their assets in, in that financial institution. And the portal was uh, built using a tool called Semantic web, web, web Builder, which is a content management system. And this content management system incorporates uh, Spring Security as part of its, uh, of its frameworks and other, other uh, frameworks too, and we interviewed the architect of the board. So in summary, these are the case studies that we have. We have OpenEMR, which is a no adoption approach. We have Code One, which is a no, no adoption approach before the, the, the framework was introduced, and partial adoption after the framework was introduced. And we have Parksoft and the financial institution as full adoption case study. So how we conducted the interviews? Uh, so we, we asked six questions to the architects. So the questions that we asked were, uh, what were your primary drivers for the system and how important was security among them? With respect to security, what were the approaches that were taken to address these particular quality attributes? How did they reason, reason about the trade-offs? How did you ensure that the programmers conform to the security approaches? And what percentage of project effort did you estimate going into security without the use of a security framework? And if they were using a security framework, what percentage of the effort it took? And finally, other comments. So with respect to the approaches, how, how we did a, a, a systematic way of uh, interviewing the architects, so what we did is that we created uh, some questionnaires based on the tactics catalog that I, uh, that I spoke about earlier. So for each one of the tactics that we have in the catalog, we asked a few questions. First, is this tactic supported in your system? Two, if it's supported, how did you support that particular tactic in your system? What decisions did you make to support it? Uh, indicate the uh, difficulty or risk of implementing that particular tactic. So if a tactic was, for example, of a medium difficulty, it would be labeled as an M for medium difficulty. And also describe the rationale for the, the design decisions that were made and explain the implications for this decision. So what types of questions did we have? So for example, so since you remember that one of the categories for the security taxis, tactics was the detection of attacks, so we would ask them questions like, how does your system support the detection of intrusions, right? And we, we gave them examples like to better understand what it meant to support a particular tactic. So again, uh, the same for detection, for example, this other tactic, this detection of denial, and there were more tactics in the detection attacks, resisting attacks, so we have here identification of actors, limiting access, 
etc., etc. So we have this, this questionnaire, and the questionnaire looks like, look like that. It's a table, and they are available online uh, for you if you, if you wanna if you wanna take a look at them or use them in your own system. So what kind of answers they gave us, so for example, for detecting intrusion, some of them said, well, this primarily was enforced through the use of, of hardware firewalls. Some spoke about the frameworks who were using the, uh, who were that were used, uh, so they could uh, help in detecting intrusion. Uh, here we see for detecting uh, denial of service, in this case it was the ZK framework, in this case was the hardware firewall, and like this, we had we had all uh, a series of answers from the architects who explained to us how they were uh, addressing these uh, these uh, security uh, tactics. Or sometimes they would say, "We're not supporting this particular tactic." So we we did these interviews with the architects, and then we did the second part of the experiment, which was analyzing their systems, you know, their, their running systems. But for since we were really interested in, in understanding things and more at the software uh, point of, uh, at the software uh, level, we disabled we asked them to disable the firewalls, right? Because the firewalls could uh, since we were analyzing externally from their companies, if they had a firewall it would it would block the uh, app scan. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this with this tool, but it performs automated dynamic analysis, which probe the running application in a way that would be similar to what a hacker would be doing. So it, it does plenty of of, uh, of attacks into into uh, an, an application, and then it gives you reports like this one, and it tells you like the number of issues. For example, here, uh, an email address pattern was found. Uh, and uh, client side cookie references, etc. So there's different levels of threats that apps can analyze. So after we did all this, we ended up having uh, the following results, which I summarize here. So here we see the five, the, the four uh, different case studies, and in the case of Acme, we have two before and after. And uh, we see, we can see, for example, here. Well, in this case, four of the system or four of the five were um, in Java, and one of them was in PHP. You can see the size of the systems. So Acme, small system, around 8,000 lines of code. Forks of 16,000 lines of code. OpenEMR, much bigger, 255,000 lines of code, and the web portal, around uh, 100,000 line, uh, lines of code. And here's the results from uh, app, from AppScan. So if you see, we have here the different uh, vulnerability levels. And uh, so this is high, this is medium, low, and the I is informative. So I'm going to go back into these results later. We see the number of URLs that uh, were analyzed, the number of threat classes. So, uh, so AppScan categorizes the the vulnerabilities into what they call threat classes. And uh, we and this is the result from the interviews. So, how many of the tactics? We have 17 tactics. How many did you address in your system? And of them, how them? How many of them were addressed uh, in a doc ad hoc way instead? So, uh, how many of them were addressed within application logic as opposed to being addressed? by a particular security framework. And finally, how much effort, as a percentage of the total project effort, did you put into uh, the, the security for your system? So let's first see the no adoption uh, case studies. So remember, we have two, two examples here. We have the, uh, the, the, the Korean portal before the framework was introduced. And the the open source uh, EMR application. So as you can see, look here at the number of high level vulnerabilities. So in particular, this web portal is uh, yeah, it really had a very high number of, of uh, vulnerabilities. A high cost of security. So so people here, or the arch the architect estimated that he spent around 20% of the effort in dealing with security, but they didn't really give them 
such a good result, as at least according to uh, what apps can uh, reveal. And if you see, they didn't implement that many tactics. In this case, he only implemented six tactics, and here nine. But most of them were uh, coded by him. In this case, and here also a majority were coded by him. So the partial adoption, in this case, we had only one, one example, which was when the, when the framework was introduced. And we see now zero, uh, zero high severity vulnerab vulnerabilities, but we still have a high cost of, uh, of, in terms of effort for security. And we see a few, we see now more tactics that were addressed, and comparatively it's a fewer number with respect to the no adoption approach. Right? And finally, we see the systems that adopted uh, frameworks early on. In this case, these two systems had zero high severity vulnerabilities, a lower co cost in terms of effort, again at the software level, for uh, introducing security, and very few tactics. They had, a, uh, in this case, a good number of tactics were implemented. A few of these tactics had to be coded by the art. In this case, when the this is the transition of the before and after system, so we see there is a significant reduction here in the number of, of high-level vulnerabilities, but still a huge number uh, of, or you can see this is a, a high number, because there was a, a, an analysis and they decided they, they would only address the most, uh, the, the higher risk vulnerabilities in this system. So the conclusion, with, which can be pretty obvious, but you have to take into account that there have not been studies like this by, by the time we, we, uh, we did it. The obvious conclusion is that the uh, early adoption approach, thinking about security right from the beginning, is the one that provides the best results, right? But there are some, well, <laughs> our results, there can be some threats to uh, validity of these results. We used only a single scanner. We should probably have used more, but again, this is not something that it's so easy for, for us to, to obtain several access to several of these scanner. also, scanners. Also, the estimation of effort that the architect did, it was not supported by hard data. They did uh, an estimation on what they believed, but since their judgment was, were consistent, this gave us confidence. Also, as I said, we have a low number of case studies, but it, it, it was not really that simple to, to identify this, and this may not apply to every domain. Mm, so the conclusion here was, it is in terms at the software level, you're gonna be coding aspects of security, certain uh, security tactics, well, you're better off using a framework Ideally, right from the beginning, and if worse comes to worse, at least introduce it later on. However, if you introduce it later on, of course, it's going to take more effort and probably provide less good results. So the full adoption approach is the one that provides best, best results. And the worst is, of course, uh, trying to code things all the, all the, from, from, from the ground up. So why why frameworks are uh, a good solution, a good a good uh, design concept? Well, typically, developers are not security experts, and the frameworks are developed by people who are more knowledgeable in security. So they're probably going to be doing a better job in uh, creating code that is going to be dealing with the with the with the potential threats. Uh, there's this increases the probability that things are going to be done in a consistent way. And this also frees time or takes less time for the developers so that they can concentrate on the, on the development of application logic or business logic. Of course, there is one difficulty, which is that you need to maintain your frameworks up to date, right? Because you introduce a particular version of your framework at a particular point in time, uh, the system evolves, and if you're not updating these frameworks, they may uh, now have new vulnerabilities, but the tool that was shown earlier, I think, can help, help in that. So the recommendation, and I think it's the, the, a message that is in sync with the presentation that we saw earlier, is that you need to consider security 
from the beginning of the development of your system, uh, ensure that security requirements are gathered, so if you, uh, your list of quality attributes, you at least must be sure or make sure that you're thinking about security there, and uh, even if the customer is not giving you secure requirements, uh, or not expressing drivers about security, you still need to think about them. Of course, the use of frameworks is just a very small part of the equation. We saw many, many strategies in the, in the other presentation that are uh, necessary to, to achieve a, a, a good security. Uh, follow uh, organizational best, best practices like the OWASP guidelines. Also important in, uh, in a methodological point of view, practice architectural evaluation. So in the architectural evaluation, you present or you, the architect, present your architecture to a, a team who's going to be uh, questioning the decisions that you made. And ideally, if there's somebody who's uh, knowledgeable of, about security in the, in the evaluation team, he's going to be probing the, the uh, decisions against security. And you can, well, you can also use uh, the questionnaire that I uh, showed earlier as a checklist so that you can, as we did in the interviews, make sure that at least you've made decisions for each one of these uh, vulner uh, yeah, vulnerability uh, cl classes. And that's it, and I take the opportunity to make some advertisements to the <laughs> for, for our book, which includes uh, this, uh, the questionnaires not only for security, but for other quality attributes. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, of course, questions. Thank you for the data. Uh, quick question. I may miss it. Uh, all the companies from your research uh, were making profit at the time? Profit from this system? Uh, no, I mean profit uh, as a company. All of them were successful. Um, well, we didn't really gather information about about uh, whether the companies were profitable in that point. I would say probably yes. But why is that question? Yeah, kind of. Uh, thank you. No, no, but, but why that question? Um, you, you were saying that uh, we should consider it at the very beginning uh, using frameworks. But the research doesn't, um, doesn't say kind of like, is it helping for new companies or it may harm? Because if we don't study companies which, for example, because they started security very early and overthinking it, might they lose opportunities okay. and didn't make a business at all. Which means, yeah, it's, it's a kind of like a bad case. Yeah, in truth, we really would have needed a much bigger sample to, to, to have better conclusions. But as I was saying, it was not really that easy to, to obtain access to, to the systems. And the, the companies really, when, when we told them we're going to be performing the vulnerability analysis, which actually was performed uh, by the Korean company, Code One, they had the, 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 uh, the app scanner, they were like not very happy to. Uh, uh, to open up the firewall and let the, the, the app scanner be run from Korea, so that, that was not so easy. Mm -hmm. There's a question about app scanner. If I understand correctly, it uh, scans the code. It's, it, no, it doesn't scan the code. It, it acts as a, as a client to the... It scans all the URLs. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And how many false positives they have on that report? I mean, we saw really huge numbers of uh -huh. critical vulnerabilities, but have you analyzed how many false positives? No, in truth, for this study, we really only took the numbers uh, as, as they came from, from uh, AppScan, and we focused on just the numbers of high level, medium level, and low level. The thing again is that we weren't running the app scanner. It was being run for us, and we were provided the, 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 uh, the reports. So it was more difficult to to, uh, to do this type of analysis. Uh, can you suggest some uh, open source or free tool, the same as App Scanner? Other other uh, other um, tools similar to App Scanner? Yeah, you mean, which uh, that is source? free or open source. So as I was saying, I'm not a security expert, but maybe uh, Anastasia is your name. Uh, 
some free tool, the same as App Scanner, like open source or free. Co code analysis is a but like URL little analysis, bit different, like, like URL like analysis. analysis. Uh, there are tools that try to simulate the user behavior, like user who is knocking on those URLs, right? Uh, assessing web pages, for example, assessing resources. Yes, there are tools. I'm not sure if I can name them like that, mm -hmm. but I will check and I can send them the link for I hope you can give I don't know, at the, the time we, we investigated, but uh, yeah, I can really remember if we find, found many alternatives. Yeah, the VASP, they have the category uh, about like, uh, finding the vulnerability search, and they have even a lot of examples of vulnerable applications, and the set of tools that you can actually use on this vulnerable application to test it, or if you're doing your own tool, you can use their, like, their apps to, to test your tool. So I, I'm sure they have something like listed. Thank you. Bert, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, you you had uh, in a column uh, cost of the security kind of like... Kind of yeah, the effort that the architects ah, so estimated uh, for, that it took them at the code level uh, to address security. It, it, it is for every uh, incident or only for high... No, no, uh, overall for their, for their systems. So this architect said, uh, it took me 10% of my effort at the code level. No, not per, it doesn't have to do with the incident. It was rather at the design level, how much effort did, did they put into thinking about security. Uh, so again, this is, we ha you have to take it with a grain of salt, uh, of salt because we just asked them, we didn't give them like a methodology of, this is how you're gonna quantify this, uh, the, your effort. So just let us know how much do you think that it, that it and you've me. been asking them uh, that percentage of their total uh, tasks, their what total amount tasks. of security, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of for their system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that maybe even more, uh, more interesting than uh, seeing whether these are precise numbers is that we do see a, like a big difference between the systems where the architects hadn't uh, considered the use of incorporating tools where they, they themselves felt like they had spent a lot of effort in dealing with security versus the other ones who, who hadn't, uh, who used the tools. I think that's more interesting than the actual number uh, in cell. Questions? Uh, I'm just curious, what would be your, your next steps? Uh, because you know, you mentioned you are from academic field, still you are very interested in a real business, and I'm just curious, how are you going, what are your next steps to help companies like SER actually uh -huh. to build the kind of tool that architects, for example, will be using, uh, just you know, in a way, in an effective way, to propose, to, for example, to our clients, in order to the design phase, for example. Okay, so, this, this research, uh, in truth, we didn't really continue that much in this, in this line. So maybe uh, what, what we really wanted more was to, to pass this message, which I think uh, yeah, yeah. in your company you already have it, right? But mm -hmm. many companies or, or many architects may not be so uh, sensi sensitive about thinking but, architecturally yeah. about, about security. So, I would say that m more than anything, uh, here what we wanted is more to, to, to have some, like some uh, evidence that it made sense to, to think architecturally and uh, adopt these tools early on. But, but, uh, I'm just curious about the next step, I mean, next level. I mean, yeah, you show that using the frameworks just help you uh, from the start, minimize the cost, right? optimization from the beginning, but what, do you have something in mind, like what would be the next? It would have probably good to, to refine this, this uh, study with a bigger number of participants and probably other vulnerability scanners, and maybe we could also study other approaches which are not only the use of frameworks, maybe the use of other, other approaches for security it would be interesting too to, to compare uh, how, how, how 
What's the difference? Exactly. More questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I'd like also to join you in advertising your book. Uh, uh, you know, guys, that uh, in fact there is a chapter in that book uh, contributed by your fellows of service, uh, Serge Kaziev and Dogger Kitsai. And all, and all in all, this book is very, it, I'd say, it's an excellent introduction into the uh, architectural design and methodology. So it's, it's really great. I also can re recommend it. And uh, my question is uh, uh, Bert, do you have any? Like observations, maybe based on your key studies or any uh, other materials, what particular security tactics are most critical to address early in the life cycle to achieve a great effect on the security of the application? Um, what we uh, what we try to do. After this study is that we did another another research where what we studied is different different frameworks, and what we try to to see is uh, determine uh, whether like different uh, characteristics of these frameworks that would be interesting for for the developer community. Maybe that can kind of also answers uh, your question, because one thing that that uh, we believe is that. And as we saw in a pre presentation earlier, when you're designing a system, you need to select a particular tool, and the selection process is also a complicated, a complicated thing, right? So one thing that we did is that we took uh, a set of, of uh, frameworks again, many for uh, authentic authentication and authorization, and others for encryption, and we tried to analyze them in terms of. Uh, how they implemented some of the tactics, but also we gathered numbers from, from, from that were publicly online, like the how active the these were open source frameworks, how active their communities were, and uh, uh, the number of bugs, how quickly they were solved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we where we're trying to go is to try to uh, find mechanisms so that we can provide information to the architects, so that in, to help them select select uh, tools. But uh, this particular area that uh, you're mentioning, whether to what tactics to address early on or not, we haven't really explored that, that, that field. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? OK, thank you so much. You're welcome.